So in a recent video, I made this, I did this whole process of proving that the following function presented in equation one is a PDF, a probability density function. So, but I, I didn't like the way that video went. I mean, I did it by hand, just handwritten. And I think that it's better if I present it more as if I was writing a textbook. By the way, I do have a textbook for stats, but it's not, a, it doesn't go into this depth because most people aren't interested in proving these functions, not, let alone even knowing what the functions are. So this is more for, these are extra, when I, when I present these videos or exercises for me as well as for people who are interested. So this is what we know as the, the function for the normal distribution. So the normal distribution is this beautiful bell-shaped curve that is symmetrical. And if the mean, which mu here is zero and the standard deviation is one, we have this standard normal distribution, this will just be x squared over two. So so that, and then this of course, would that would eliminate this sigma over here. So the sigma represents the standard deviation, sigma square represents the variance. But so we're just gonna here prove that this is a probability density function. One thing we know from probability theory is that in order to be considered a probability density function, if we summate across all values of whatever the function is with all, all mutually exclusive events, because in any sample space you have a, any number of events, right? Like, a, it, for instance, in flipping a coin, there's only two possible events, heads or tails, whatever coins you may be using in your country. <laughs> in the US, we do heads and tails, because we have a head on the one side and then the other side we call it tails but you may have a bird on one side, I have no idea. So you flip the coin, you only have two options. So those are the only two possible events that occur within a sample space. And the probability of those events, since they're mutually exclusive, they cannot to occur together, must equal one. Well, the same thing happens when we have a continuous variable. So in the case of a flip of a coin, you're dealing with a discrete variable. You can count the events and you can, they can go to infinity. Like for instance, if you're counting the number of cars that pass in front of a house or something within an hour. You can look at my Poisson video if you're interested in that. You summate, but when we're dealing with, with continuous variables like a normal distribution, something like weight, height, whatever, we integrate over all values and they still the integral still must equal one. So this is what I do here with equation two. So this, I show this um, integral, integrating from negative infinity, infinity. Again, so we're using this normal distribution. So its tails will go off to the ends of the of time and space in an infinite direction, both negative and positive. So let's start by simplifying this equation because it looks like crap right now and difficult and let's just make it a little easier. So we'll let z equal x minus mu divided by sigma. This is just your, your standard standardization equation. And if you take in stats 101 or intro stats, you know that z values are used in, in all kinds of statistical tests. So now we're converting here from one coordinate system that has x to the z. So we have to take the derivative of this. And you'll see why we do this, because essentially we have to get rid of this dx and replace it with a dz. We're not dealing with x's anymore. So we take the derivative of this function with respect to x and we get one over sigma dx and then we can solve for dx so it's sigma dz this is going to be very important in a moment as we continue further here but we'll see later uh, we'll have to do this again when we're converting between the, these cartesian coordinate system to polar coordinates so let's substitute this into the equation so the z goes where the x minus mu over sigma was so you see the sigma disappears, we just have z squared here. We still have this, this annoying sigma here. However, because we did this transformation and, and we took its derivative here, I guess you can call it a Jacobian, right? And it's what will allow us to, is to, to cross these puppies out here, right? Sigma and sigma will cross out because this is in the denominator and this is the numerator. Now, you'll notice also that I pulled out this one over square root of two pi prior to eliminating the sigma because this this is a constant it doesn't involve z in any way here 
So we pull that out, we rearranged everything, and of course those two sigmas cross each other out. So we're left with this beautiful function here, one over square root of two pi, and again the integral for e to the minus z squared over two dz. So we, we made this conversion, we did we took care of everything. Now, so now this is one of the, the solution of this integral is complicated and you can't just do stuff like use substitutions and all that stuff. So what some clever person did many moons ago was decide, hey, let's just square this puppy, okay? So instead of this being I, well, let's call this equation I, so let's just square it. You know, why not get two? And I, I relate that to this, these old commercials about the Ginsu knives and all these uh, infomercials you always get on TV. They always give you two of everything. Why do I want two? I just want one, you know? I don't need two Ginsu knives. I need one Ginsu knife, not two. Okay, so we have one over square. We're, we're just basically squaring this. So I'm gonna pull these two apart they are identical at this point, but it doesn't really matter if this is z, y, q, or whatever. It's still the same function, so we just make an arbitrary change here. Instead of z, we have a y. So we have a z squared, so we divide this into the z squared over 2 and then the y squared over 2. We have two separate, now we have two, two separate variables we're dealing with here. And of course, since we're squaring this puppy here, 1 over square root of 2 pi becomes 1 over 2 pi and times this double integral. Both of them went from negative infinity to infinity. And we, you know, we're basically dealing with this z and y. These are still in the Cartesian coordinate system, you know, the coordinate system you're used to. Well, we can rearrange this because these are powers here, the powers that be. We can add them together. So we get e to the minus z squared plus y squared over 2. Uh, over two. This is starting to look like something that we know called the Pythagorean theorem. See, a lot of times you gotta use these knowns from other types of math and then see, can I do something with them to simplify my life? I'm trying to make my life a lot easier. So here we have equation eight, which is r squared. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna use the Pythagorean theorem because we, we have this um, hypotenuse square equals the sum of the two sides squared. So here we're going to do r squared equals z squared plus y squared. So let me show you this figure just so you understand what I'm doing here. If we let z equal the vertical axis and y equal the horizontal axis, this little guy right here is r, the radius, right? So the radius of a circle. So we look, we got a circle here. So that's why we're going to the polar coordinates. And the, the angle made by the radius and the, see that should go directly to zero. I'm a little bit off there. I'm not a very good artist is theta, all right? So we know this, this circle, this theta can range from zero, an angle of zero to two pi, and we know this radius can range from zero to infinity and beyond. I'm just kidding, but to infinity, right? So, so now we want to get rid of the z and y and put it in terms of these polar coordinate system. So there's some knowns that we have here. We know that the sine of, uh, of theta here, right? The sine of theta is the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So the opposite, so this is the z, right? Because this is the vertical axis. So this would be z divided by r, which is the radius here. So then we can solve for z because we want to eliminate z and get into these polar coordinates. So if we solve for z, we got z equals r sine theta. And we can do the same for eliminating the y we know that the cosine of theta of this angle is the adjacent line divided by the hypotenuse, so it's y divided by r. And so we get equation 12 here, solving for y we get r cosine theta. Now here I just show you that this works essentially. So if I set r squared, well because remember we had z squared plus y squared. So we have to square both of these. We have to square z squared and y squared. So we have r squared equals, well, it's r squaring this, this element here, this first element, r sine squared, r, r sine theta would be r squared sine squared theta. And then squaring this guy right here, we get r squared cosine squared theta. Well, we also know that sine squared theta plus cosine theta squared theta equals one. That's, that's unknown that we have. So that this is basically gonna be r squared equals r squared. So we just showed that this works out fine. So we can now substitute 
r squared for z squared plus y squared in equation 7, and that's exactly what we did right here. We substitute r squared for z squared plus y squared. So we've already simplified it, but we still have these dz and dy, so this is still in the, in the Cartesian coordinate system, and we want it to be in the polar coordinate system. So we're going to pull out the polar express here and take the absolute value of the Jacobian. Remember I mentioned that before because when we made the conversion from from x to z we had to take the derivative. To basically we have to, make, we have to be able to get rid of this dz dy here. And we use this equation for the Jacobian which is actually the absolute value of the Jacobian is the determinant of this matrix right here. So the determinant you um, multiply across this way and then subtract the other the other cross um, product here. So, but first we need the dz, we need to, um, so we'll go back to our, our equations that we had before, right? And we have to solve for them, right? Take the derivatives with respect to theta, and then r, because you'll notice the, the equation for z, where was that? Right here includes both an r and a theta, right? So we need to solve for both of them. So there's, there's two, two, two different um, items that we have to solve for. So we do dz d theta, so dz d theta is r cosine theta, so it's the derivative with respect to theta is r cosine theta, the derivative with respect to r is sine theta. Again, you know, if you're not really familiar with that, you need to look at your derivative, some derivative table somewhere, and you'll figure that out. And, the, and then we go and also solve for the y equation here. We'll take its derivative with respect to r and respect with respect to theta, and we get or with theta and then res with respect to r, we get minus r sine theta, cosine theta. And then again, we like I said, getting the determinant is this cross, this first cross product right here. So it's r square cosine square, which conveniently works out to r cosine square theta. And then we subtract this other product here, right? And this other diagonal. So minus minus r sine square theta, which again is really convenient because again, this will give us r times cosine squared plus sine squared, which already we know that cosine squared plus sine squared or sine squared plus cosine sine squared equals one, right? So this will just leave us with an r, and we take the absolute value of r, which is just r in this case. So we're left with r dr d theta. Ooh, how nice. So now we can substitute this for the dz dy. See what I did right there? Look, here we had dz dy, now we substitute r dr d theta in there. How beautiful, it is beautiful. It is so, so beautiful. Now we'll, okay, next step. We wanna finally solve for this and we'll use a u substitution here. We'll let u equal r squared, no, u, no me, no, u. No, I meant the letter u, sorry. <laughs> u equal r squared over two. So we ended, uh, this is then gonna end up being just minus u. And then we take the derivative of this u function here, and with respect to r, so it's r dr. Okay, so solving for dr, because we want to get rid of the dr and turn this into a u now, right? So dr equals du over r, which conveniently gets rid of this little r here, right? It's going to get, because now we're going to multiply, so we're, we're substituting du over r for dr here, so those r's are going to cross out. This is what we're left with. So we're left with this really, really nice function. Well, notice I also broke it apart here because this is the, the um, integral for d theta going from 0 to 2 pi. And this is the integral for, for r going from 0 to pi. Infinity, excuse me, 0 to infinity. And we're, this is what we have left. See, I got rid of all those annoying terms here. Now this is really, really easy to do. So we just have to take these individual, solve for these individual integrals. Solve for these individual integrals. And this first part, this is just theta, right? There's just no term here. This is just one, and it's antiderivative is theta. So theta, and we're solving it from 2 pi to 0, right? And you, this is cal regular calculus stuff, and you should know how to do this already if you're watching this video. If you don't, then you should look it up. And then we have this integral left here. Well, this is just going to actually equal to 2 pi. And we're going to be left with 1 over 2 pi times. So this is this is the first integral, right? Because you, in case you don't know, it's 2 pi minus 0. This theta is going to equal 0 in the second part. So it's going to be basically 2 pi times 2 
1 over 2 pi times 2 pi, you'll see that'll cancel out. The second part will just um, conduct this integral here, and its antiderivative is minus e to the minus u, and we're solving for it from infinity, 0 to infinity. Well, when it's infinity, this is going to approach 0, because this is the same as 1 over, well, minus 1 over e to the u, because you drop this into the denominator, and as that approaches infinity, that whole function will approach 0, right, because the denominator is getting huge. And then the last part, e to the 0, is going to be 1, so we're going to have 1 times 0 plus 1 is 1, and this is equal to 1. Finally, we take the square root, get rid of that i square, and look, we got 1. That's what we wanted. So we have proven, or I have proven, or we have proven, the royal we have proven that this indeed is the, this indeed is a PDF, or the PDF for this normal distribution. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you have any questions, obviously, you can let me know. Bye.